I'm Philip Dumas from EJEC, and I'm happy for to join all of this webinar about GeoRisk. Um, so it will be a one-hour webinar. Um, we will start with a presentation from Jochen Schneider from Enerchange regarding the Event Praxis Forum, because during this Event Praxis Forum, we'll have also a GeoRisk session. After, I will shortly present the GeoRisk project. So this project started one year ago. It's the second webinar, so maybe some of you are familiar, and for those not familiar, I will just give a five-minute presentation about the project. I will then give the floor for a first discussion about risk assessment. First, an introduction and a presentation of a risk register by Thomas Le Guenant from BRGM. First, some criteria about risk assessment by Ferit Seidov from Gecko. And finally, some perspective about an online tool we are about to create also by Thomas Le Guenant from BRGM. We will then give the floor to Nicole Lupi from SFOE, the Swiss Federal Office of Energy, to prepare uh, and uh, we will prepare and, and will present a report on how to establish a geothermal de-risking scheme. So what are the legal framework and regulatory basis you need for that? We will then have a short presentation by Thomas Garabetian from EJEC about a new regulation on sustainable finance for geothermal energy. We will conclude this webinar by a 15 minute Q&A session and you will be here free to ask all your questions. So I immediately now give the floor to Jochen Schneider, who will present you the Praxis Forum. Jochen, the floor is yours. Jochen, you are self-muted. You have to unmute yourself. OK. OK. Thank you very much, Philip, for the introduction. And thanks a lot for organizing this webinar. I'm very glad, uh, on the one hand, that uh, we were invited for this webinar. And on the other hand, we are also very glad uh, that the GeoRisk workshop uh, will take place during the Praxis Forum Geothermal. Geothermie.bio. I will give you a short program overview uh, very briefly and then uh, go to some facts about the German geothermal market. And yes, this will be the, the main topic of my presentation. We will start uh, in about 10 days with this. Praxis Forum Geothermie.Bayern with uh, three workshops. The first workshop will be the KAT workshop about inhibitors in the, in the morning of 7th October. And then in the afternoon, there are two parallel workshops. There is on the one hand, the use of geothermal production pumps, where the suppliers will introduce their um, top level models. And there is also uh, the GeoRisk workshop where we are here in, in, within this webinar uh, more about this. October 8th, there is the Congress Day. Uh, we have uh, several keynotes in the morning and uh, then some technical and uh, also political forums here to introduce. Uh, we will talk about the future of geothermal energy. In the afternoon sessions, um, there will be the, the Minister of Bavaria, Mr. Eiwanger, will give a speech here and uh, he will also give the awards of the Geothermal Energy uh, Award uh, to the operators of the plants and then we will also award the Christian Hechter Award for the Young Scientists. Um, uh, the late afternoon sessions uh, here, it's especially interesting. Uh, we look at the geothermal development of the Eastern Molas Basin. We have a Geothermie Alliance Forum, and we will also look at the innovation and uh, new developments. The topics. Well, as you all know uh, from, from the movements uh, regarding the climate, the most uh, the greatest challenge uh, of nowadays is avoiding CO2 emissions. Here you see a um, slide from last year's presentation from Christiane Lose, 
from the uh, Umweltbundesamt in Germany, and uh, she, she just, just showed how uh, the heat and the power supply has to be reduced uh, to reach the goals of the CO2 emissions in Germany. And if you look at 2050 for the heat reduction, uh, we see this blue bar, which is mainly shallow geothermal, and then we see this orange bar with it, uh, which is district heating. And in her opinion, most of the district heating can fill by geothermal. Well, this should be around 100 terawatt hours uh, per year what is needed. So how far are we up to now? Uh, I will give you an overview about the geothermal plants in operation in Germany. Well, German, Germany is a bit a different location like Turkey or Italy or uh, the, the Western US. Uh, it's, a, it's a low enthalpy geothermal area. And so the development uh, is like other countries in Middle Europe, uh, a bit smaller in, in scale. But so far in Germany, there are 37 plants in operation. We have 27 heat plants. We have two power plants which do not supply heat so far, and we have eight heat and power plants. And if you look at, at the map, you see the distribution of different uh, heat plants at the moment. Um, the first number is the number of the plants which are online, and the second number is the installed capacity in this area. And Secondly, I will show you uh, also the power plants which are inaugurated and we see a clear hotspot which is in the south of Germany in Bavaria with 21 heat plants and seven power plants in total. So interestingly uh, is the development of the geothermal energy in Germany before 1998, it was about uh, 6.1 megawatt thermal energy installed. And then in the 2000 years, it just started uh, to increase. We had several problems, which um, always gave a fallback uh, in, during the installation. This was the global finance crisis in 2008. And then there was, uh, in, in Germany, uh, we call it uh, Strompreisbremse, the translation would be power price break, uh, where two ministers questioned the Renewable Energy Source Act. But we also have some, uh, some pushing moments uh, in the German de geothermal development, and this was the Renewable Source Act. And you see clearly um, that with the inauguration of the Renewable Source Act, the, the power plants were installed, but also the heat plants increased significantly. So this means that uh, such a funding like the Renewable Energy Source Act is not only subjected to, to power, but also uh, subject of heat. And if you look now at, at the Great Munich area or, or the, the Molas Basin, you see this uh, in this, this map, uh, which is from the uh, Bavarian uh, Atlas of Geothermal, you see in, in the Great Munich area the, a lot of rot, red dots, which um, are the, the power plants and the heat plants in operation. And you see a few more to the eastern path. And we have here in 23 plants in operation with this, uh, which is about 322 megawatt. Um, and we have also about 33 megawatt uh, electrical power installed. Two are under construction. This is, well, I think that everybody knows so far this is the, the project of the Stadtwerke Munich uh, here in the center of Munich, which is planned to have a um, 50 megawatt heat capacity. And the other project is here in the eastern part is from the Silenos AG, uh, which uh, has around 6.5 
megawatt uh, electrical electrical capacity. So, but what is happening in the future? Um, we will we will have a lot of projects which develop, especially in the eastern part of the Molas Basin. These are around six or seven projects uh, which here are expected. And in total, there are nine plants, and this will result in a significant increase uh, of the, uh, the the heat production of about 150 megawatt, and also in the electricity production of about 50 megawatt. Some of these projects you will uh, see also in the Praxis Forum. They will be introduced in, in the afternoon session. And uh, yes, the, the investors uh, are here uh, also to ask in the end uh, your questions. What we can conclude from this uh, so far in, in Bavaria, we have, um, or in Germany, we, we produce each year around 100 terawatt hours uh, uh, sorry, uh, around one terawatt hour of electric of heat, and we produce about 150 to 200 megawatt hours of electricity. But um, this is far away from the goals we have to reach. So this increase, what I uh, introduced in in my last slide, uh, is also very necessary, and we need much further projects. And within this respect, I think it's very important to have such a, a tool um, which is developed by by EJEC uh, and to have these workshops about the geo risk. Finally, I want to conclude. I want to. So go to the uh, last day of the Praxis Forum, where we will visit the newest plant in the area, it's the plant. And uh, we also will have a look at the at the Poing plant, which is a, a small heating plant, and it's so far uh, the best surveyed project uh, regarding seismicity in the Bavarian Monospers. So I thank for your attention, and I would be pleased uh, to see you uh, in 10 days at the Praxis Forum Geothermy Bio. So uh, lots of uh, yes, greetings from my side, and I'm very interested in what now is presented in the GeoRisk Hub. Thank you very much, Shoshin, for this interesting presentation. I will now take back the floor to present you Briefly, GeoRisk, before giving the floor to Thomas Le Gunner and Ferit Seidas for a report on risk assessment. So what is GeoRisk? GeoRisk is a project started one year ago with a duration of 30 months, aiming at establishing as much as possible de-risking or risk insurance scheme in Europe. What we have in mind is to design a risk insurance scheme according to the market maturity. So that was our first idea from the start. But you see that from this first idea to design the tool according to market maturity, we are going further now. And both Thomas Le Guenon and Ferit Silef will present you what is the result of this criteria for market maturity and uh, risk assessment. You can see the partners. We are mainly covering six countries, France, Turkey, Hungary, Poland, Greece, and Switzerland, and Germany. But with that, you will see later we want to go larger in Europe, but also globally. You can see here the coverage. So the countries red are, are the, the main countries, but we want also to test some tools in other countries, highlighted in green. And also outside Europe, we have first targeted Africa and South America, mainly Kenya, Chile, and Mexico, but we are open to new opportunities. And for example, we know that there's interest both from the USA and Canada to participate to collaboration on establishing risk insurance schemes. So we are also open to new ideas. Our work is divided in four main activities. First is the risk assessment. I will not go 
to the detail of that because uh, it's it's the objective of a second session of a presentation but with three categories of, of three tasks first to identify the potential risk secondly to assess this risk and thirdly to report uh, how we can assess this risk with an online tool secondly we are looking at how we can mitigate this risk, this risk but we focus not on technical mitigation, but only on financial mitigation. So we are looking for financial de-risking tools. And it will be the objective of the second session and the presentation about the framework condition for establishing a new insurance scheme. You can see that also this work will include other aspects, but that will be more the objective of a workshop we have in Munich, notably the task three, on looking at the condition for a transition in the different insurance scheme according to market maturity. A new activity just started last month is how we can develop so these schemes in three main countries, target countries, Greece, Hungary, and Poland. So here we are really looking at with funding agencies, with the Ministry of Energy, how in the next 18 months we can establish a risk insurance scheme. An activity just started, but it will long for also the next two years, is how we can have a replication. So when we have our product, we test our product in Greece, Hungary, and Poland, how it can be also further developed. And we know that there's interest in many countries in Europe. Uh, I just mentioned some, Denmark. Uh, we know that Netherlands uh, also is interested to collaborate to see transition. Belgium is also interested. There's already a scheme in Flanders, but Wallonia is looking for it. Croatia, Slovenia, but also we know that Spain, for Canary Island, and other ones in Europe would be interested. Out of Europe, I mentioned Chile, Kenya, Mexico, but I say also we have started some discussion with USA and Canada, so we are open up for new collaboration. With that, I, I, I conclude my, my presentation, because what is important now is to look at what have been the first results of our project. So to start with the first results, I will now give the floor to Thomas Le Guenon. Thomas, the floor is yours. So good, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. So I'm just waiting to be able to share my screen. I make you presenter. Here you are. Okay. okay. Is it uh, is it working? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I'm Thomas Logino and uh, from BRGM, and uh, so I will talk about the risk assessment more package. Also with Ferit Seidov from Gecko, we we will present the, the second task. Very briefly, the, the work package was uh, consisted in, in three tasks, uh, as uh, Philip mentioned. The first one was to identify all the potential risks and to build a risk register. The second task was to assess those risks and to see uh, which one would be most uh, important to, to mitigate or to de-risk. And the, and the third uh, one, uh, which is ongoing, uh, has just started, uh, is to, to propose tools, uh, or, so in this case, online tool for developers uh, in order to, to assess their own risk. The, the objective of this work package, so as I said, is to assess and present the, the risks, and specifically those that could be mitigated financially. Uh, in a risk assessment or even a risk management uh, approach, the, the, main, the first step is uh, to identify the risk. And so, so we need to provide the list of all plausible risks. Uh, we define the risk as uh, taking the point of view of operator developers and the risk is to not being able to reach the initial objective, whether technical, economic, environmental, or in terms of safety. And at this stage, uh, it's important to say that we are scanning everything that is possible. And it doesn't it does not mean that all the risks are important. We, but we want to have the list because if 
a risk is not on the list, then it's not considered, then it's not mitigated. Um, so I, I go quickly here because this was already presented in the previous webinar we had in February and uh, everything, the, the report is issued and is on the website. But the main thing is that we looked at to an extensive um, uh, wealth of, of documents and, and previous projects and uh, as well as the consortium, uh, the experience from each partner of the consortium. We uh, first had the too many risks, so we, we met, met and we made the simpler risk register and now the final version has about 50 risks. Uh, you have here the overview, so given the time we have, I won't go into the, the details of all the risks we have, but it's available on the website uh, and you can find it under the publications uh, and, and it's called the risk register. There's two tabs in the, in the main file. Uh, the first tab is simple, uh, which has mainly the 50 individual risks and, and the main categories. And in the detailed tab, we also include some mitigation measures and we have about 110 entries. This, also, this work is also uh, in, in progress, I say, so there's uh, room for improvement for mitigation measures. In detail, uh, what we consider important uh, to is the first one is a phase where the risk can happen. So we have four phases before drilling, uh, then drilling and before exploitation, then the exploitation phase and then the post closure phase. We consider two kinds of consequences, either mostly on economic objective and performance uh, objectives or uh, health, safety, environment risks. And for now, we consider two kinds of mitigation action, which are technical or de-risking action, if you want, technical um, actions and financial. So that's where we will find the insurance schemes. We will also in the future uh, might consider the, all the legal and regulatory uh, actions we can, which can be part of the uh, solutions. So, uh, without going into detail, the current list of risks uh, includes six categories, which are external hazards, uh, external uh, risk due to the external concert, context, risks due to internal deficiencies of developers or operators, uh, subsurface uncertainties, which is probably the main focus of this project. Then we have technical issues, particularly during drilling and uh, and. Uh, Workovers, and then the uh, another category that we have, the, which is environmental risk. But of course, this risk may come from technical issues or deficiencies. Uh, our goal was to be comprehensive, and so there could be overlaps. But it's better to have overlaps than gap. And um, several risks may be part of the same chain. There are some risks are more linked to causes, other for to consequences. And now we want to focus on, on the solution we can bring, not only on the, on the problem. Um, that's for the first task. Uh, and now I, 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 uh, we will speak about the second task. So now it's uh, Farid Seida uh, from Gecko, we, which will present it. So. So uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, carry on the uh, working package two, and for that I will be uh, presenting the following following a task of the working package two of the risk assessment. Uh, please confirm if you can see uh, what I'm going to show you. I'm Philip. Yes, it's okay. Good. So um, I'm going to go on uh, with the assessment of uh, risks that were developed in the risk registry. I'm taking the risk registry as it is and adjusting it for the survey. Um, and our goal here was to make a risk matrix. The objective is to create a portfolio for each country with its uh, unique geology and uh, a geological system. The 
for that, we have developed a risk uh, evaluation matrix. Uh, the survey was uh, made uh, with accent to find the very uh, known uh, expert in the field, thereby uh, minimizing the quantity of the uh, recipients, but maximizing the output data. And with that, the strategy was to send uh, out about 20 inquiries and get about 25% of response rate. Uh, that's that is about 20 five, uh, about five uh, answers per country. So I will go on. For, for this, we have uh, created a risk of stakeholders uh, here. For each country, we have created a list of the companies and people who are. Uh, working in the adjacent fields to geothermal, that is a drilling, research, uh, development, insurance, and other, you know, with the uh, uh, contact uh, people, uh, their email address, and so forth. And to them, were the uh, survey, the questionnaire was sent. So the questionnaire you know, was as a basis taken as the risk registry, but uh, a bit simplified uh, for the uh, for the purpose of survey. Here it has been uh, divided the same one uh, into three categories based on the uh, expertise. It's a, a social economical risks, geology and operational risks, and drilling risks. So with that, the evaluation was uh, mainly focused on the real active project to receive the data that is not so much from scientific papers, but uh, from uh, real projects, district heating and the electrical projects that are working to see what kind of challenges they are facing right now. So the risk uh, evaluation was made uh, through the risk index for the each entry and was based on the frequency and the damage. Additionally, uh, for that, uh, we have also uh, developed a relevance uh, column, which was also uh, addressing uh, the, so to say, the 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 amount of challenge that it uh, the, the each entry is presenting in the in the in the market uh, in a current situation um i'll go forward and present you the risk matrix um the likelihood has been given in a, a decimals uh and the damage was also given in a, a thousands and uh, ten thousands uh, of the uh, currency for the germany it was taken as a euro and since we have uh, both of them in a uh, powers, uh, we could uh, present them as a power of 10, the multiplication of which would be an, uh, a sum of A and B, where A is the likelihood and B is a damage. So with that, we are uh, coming to the uh, our matrix, and it has been uh, presented and developed like this where uh, the uh, evaluation of the of the risks and in, in the form of risk index from two to four was a uh, light low risk which was not requiring any uh, certain attention and was not uh, hindering for the development of the project uh, five to six was a medium which was actually requiring some uh, future work into further uh, mitigation of the risk and seven eight is a critical risk that uh, require immediate attention and uh, actions to mitigate them so this was uh, the questionnaire and the, this is how it looked uh, you can find it also on a website of uh, georisk i'm uh, moving forward and um, to present you some results that we've got uh, here you may see the how many respondents we've got here um, as I would remind you that uh, our ideal goal was to get five responses per land. In some cases, um, the Hungary, as a Hungary, Poland, they have made a workshop and increased uh, the yield from five to up to 18 responses per country. Um, I must also say that uh, some countries provided uh, much more uh, responses, but due to the fact that they were mainly research oriented or uh, incomplete, they could not be uh, used uh, for evaluation. So since uh, the time is a bit limited here, I will not be able to present each, um, each uh, evaluation of the risk for the country. 
but I've made an overview of the most challenging risks uh, overall in each country. So these tables are presenting what kind of risks are uh, currently the most challenging in, in the geothermal sector overall in all countries that, that uh, have participated in the survey. Um, so here we will see the risk uh, value, uh, uh, risk index value, how, how severe is the risk. And uh, here in the, in the bottom, you may see uh, the indexes of the risk. I will show them uh, in the next slide. And uh, here you may see the relevance of the each risk, which is, uh, as I said, uh, it is representing how much challenge it is to cope with each risk. So um, just for example, each risk could be a, a pretty uh, medium level, but um, there could be some mitigations level that are actually uh, pretty developed and could be used for that. But at the same time, some kind of risk could be pretty small but require much more work in order to overcome them. So the relevance is actually showing how much challenge each risk is representing for the developers uh, of the geothermal plants. So here I can, uh, you can see the each uh, designation of the indexes. And um, as you may see, in most of the countries, uh, the uh, political law and tax regulations are representing one of the uh, major risks as well as the lack of finances is the next risk, uh, which indicate the need for uh, the project of geo risk to be actually uh, taken. Uh, and um, hopefully its, uh, its output will assist the current situation. The other one is, um, as you may see, the first part here uh, at, the, at the left side is mainly social and economical risk. Then we're going to the part of the in the middle side uh, to the uh, geological risk whereas at the right side it is mainly the drilling risk so um, uh, um, along among the ge uh, geological risk we have the flow rate problem the flow rate is uh, lower than expected as well as the degradation of the of the of the flow and this is uh, one of the uh, common problems all uh, all over the Europe and most of the uh, geothermal systems are facing this kind of problems. The other uh, problem is the, one of the most critical problems, I would say that the target formation uh, is not being uh, found, which means that the geology is not well known uh, and require additional um, explorations. Um, in, since the, since the uh, geothermal system is not running on the water, but uh, it's on the brine with a lot of uh, components, chemical components. The scaling and corrosion problem are one of the problems that are um, also requiring some attention. And um, if left uh, unattended, they could uh, lead to additional expenses during the operation. Um, what we can see in a, a field of uh, geothermal uh, the drilling risk we can see that the well bore uh, could be damaged uh, during the drilling and uh, due, due to the unknown geology the well bore instability can occur uh, that leads to collapses in some cases as it is shown here so we're going to the relevance and we may see that in comparison with the previous chart um, I will, I will uh, just show you for the moment here that some of the risks are higher, they are high in severity, but in a, uh, in, a, in a relevance, they are not so much relevant, whereas the other are not scaling so much in a risk, uh, risk severity. However, there are, there are much more challenges with it. For example, the highest challenge, it is going up to eight, is the lack of finances, uh, and this is uh, one of the common common uh, challenges for the geothermal sector overall in Europe. So you may see that um, here there are also a target formation is not being met. It is also indicating that the geology of the reservoirs needs uh, additional exploration. Um, I believe. Um, this will be it for uh, for our short presentation for today. 
Um, I will, in a, on a workshop on 7th of October, I will present you uh, the results for each country uh, for the social, uh, socio-economical, uh, geology and drilling risk for each country to indicate what kind of challenges each country has. With this, I will finish my presentation and give over to Thomas Lignan back. Philip? Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Farid. I'm just waiting to have the the screen back. Okay. So now, quickly, we am going to speak about the third task, uh, which uh, is called tools to assess the risk and where we we want to develop an online tool for, for developers um, and to get like a global uh, recognized reporting risk code. So the, our main objectives uh, in this task was first to to present the result of, from WP2 of GeoRisk because right now it's uh, on spreadsheets and may not be very easy to to, to look at. So the risk register and the risk mitigation uh, solutions we have and uh, uh, risk analysis that was just presented. We also want to help or assist the developers or investors in structuring a risk management approach for, for their project. We want to heighten the awareness to the main risks and the possibilities to de-risk them. And uh, some actors interested in Bearing in mind that some actors interested in the development of geothermal energy may lack even the ba basic understanding of the technical details. Uh, and we have, want to highlight the risks needing in insurance schemes. So it's, it's a wrap uh, of the whole uh, raw package. It's, so it's a development in progress. Uh, so what I show you today is very preliminary, but that's what interesting. I, I, if you, I'm, I'm seeking feedbacks. <laughs> so right now we, we're thinking about two main sections. Uh, there will be a reference section where it will be possible mainly to access the results from the work package, so the risk register and the risk assessment results. And then there will be a personalized section where it, it will be possible to adapt the risk assessment for each project. The current idea is that we have the first section on the website platform directly and the second section, uh, which is more dynamic and maybe more complicated to develop, is would be available as a downloadable spreadsheet initially and, and maybe also uh, in the end. The first, uh, all the, this will be available by the end of this year and we will also develop a, a new version uh, in 2020 following feedbacks. So right now it's a prototype view, uh, it's, it's under development, but I, the, the risk register might look something like this directly on the website. So where we can filter what the, the information we want to see and, and we get still get a table of all the, the risks. So then people will be able to build upon this list to, to construct their own risk assessments. Of course, we, we can get details on, on each risk, so that's the content of the risk register, but here presented in a more, uh, in a, in a easier and nicer way. Uh, we can have the results from uh, the geo risk that uh, Ferrit told you about, but uh, maybe we can have a map where we can click on the map and, and get the results for the regions we are interested in and get the kind of charts that uh, Ferry just show you. That's just an example, so I'm not detailing. Uh, and regarding the personal, the personal and um, the project risk assessment, then we are thinking of providing a, so a spreadsheet, which would look like a lot like the survey that Ferry uh, showed you. Uh, we may have to adapt it to, to get more to, to ease the, the work uh, for the developer, but essentially where we will be guided in, into uh, assessing each risk, uh, maybe in, in a different way than we have done in the surveys 
because it, it can be in more detail. And then we can we would be able to generate charts uh, very uh, automatically and maybe get details on on the risks and maybe uh, able to compare a result for one project with the results we have for the whole uh, project. So that's uh, all for this tool. It's uh, under development, as I said. I welcome feedback. Uh, so you have here my mail. Uh, if you have some ideas, what, what would be most useful uh, for developers? And essentially, right now, we, we can generate charts. But what additional information should be available and, and, and would be very useful for developers to then go to banks, insurance, or et cetera, and to present and to to have a good uh, uh, speech about the risks. So that's all for for us. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Ferid and Thomas. It was really interesting. I see that there's a lot of interest about this presentation with several questions. So I remind all attendees that indeed we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So we took note of all your questions and they will be addressed to Ferid and Thomas at a later stage. Coming back now to the agenda, we have a session now on uh, how we establish a scheme. And for that, I give the floor to Nicole Lupi from the Swiss Federal Office of Energy. So Nicole, the floor is yours. Mm, thank you, Thomas. I hope you can all hear me. Um, and with the help of uh, Thomas and Philippe, I will um, present uh, the framework condition required uh, to establish uh, a risk insurance scheme. So on slide number two, uh, where you, there is the content of that presentation, uh, it's a very short presentation, so I will briefly introduce task 3.2 and the approach we developed to identify these framework conditions. And I will also uh, go into a bit more detail about our finding. What are those key features characterizing um, a risk mitigation scheme? So on slide three, um, one of the main risks faced by developers of geothermal energy, as mentioned Thomas earlier, is the resource risks. They are associated with the uncertainty of the subsurface. Uh, currently in Europe, there are a few countries, just like France, Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland, and many others who have already put in place some risk mitigation schemes that are covering those risks. Um, so we analyze those existing risks, and, and, and we can see that there is a number of key parameters, whether technical, economical, commercial, legal, organizational, that characterize those national systems. So the task uh, 3.2 uh, provides a review of these existing schemes, and that will complement what has been done in task 3.1. Uh, we will also address the source of the funding of these existing schemes, and we have cast them uh, in terms of public-private or public-private partnership, PPP, which is a hybrid kind type of system. So all these um, identify. Um, all these identified key aspects will be useful to then uh, set up a new scheme. On, task, on, on slide number four, you will see that this is the approach we, uh, we developed. So we develop a risk mitigation scheme questionnaire uh, that has been sent to partner countries of geo risk, but also outside uh, of the consortium. Um, as you can see on the map, uh, we got a lot of public scheme questionnaires uh, with 11 uh, received, eight of which are from uh, partner countries from GeoRisk. So that will be three in Switzerland, uh, one in Germany, two in Poland, one in Hungary, and one in Turkey. And But we also receive in the light uh, purple countries, Belgium and Netherlands, they also send us three questionnaires just to be able to have a little bit more information. Uh, in terms of uh, participation, we had much less participation for PPP and private schemes. Uh, the two PPP we got was from France. One is um, implemented for a while now, and one is in the pipeline. And the private scheme um, is from our partner, uh, Turkey. So the questionnaire we sent was actually trying to capture um, the essence of each of the um, schemes and try to distill it in, in key points. So you'll see on slide number five, 
that we identify uh, five key aspects of the risk mitigation scheme. So the first one is the legal and regulatory boundary conditions. So basically, these key aspects are to uh, provide question that needs to be answered when setting up a new scheme. So this the question would be what is the justification for engaging in the development of a new risk transfer mechanism? How do I justify setting up a new scheme? Well, that depends on the source of the funding. So for public scheme, uh, there's usually a legal basis, whether an act, an ordinance, or a decree. And the public schemes can be rooted in energy act, just like here in Switzerland, but also environmental act in Poland, CO2 act, again, here in Switzerland, or some sort of climate change regulation, like in the Netherlands. Um, and we can see that those being public scheme, they need to go through the legislative process that sometimes can be complex, especially if there are uh, several ministries um, involved in the process, and therefore they can be a bit lengthy. So uh, maybe this type of scheme, public schemes, are more better fitted for national schemes rather than regional schemes. Um, for private schemes, um, the, the legal framework is set by the Article of Association or Charter of, um, of that private entities, and that's, that's how it's set up in Turkey. And of course, for the PPP, for the private-public partnership, it has to be a compromise between the two when you have a mixture of public laws and uh, some regulation coming from the banking sector. So again, the legal and regula regulatory boundary conditions are here to justify the, the existence of the risk transfer mechanism, but it's also a good place where you can define a few parameters, such as the funding, the duration of the scheme, what kind of risk are going to be covered. So it's, it's a good place to, to give a little bit more details about the scheme. Speaking of risk, that will be the second uh, key aspect of setting up a risk mitigation scheme. So that will be on slide number six. Um, in terms of resource risk, the analysis of the questionnaire showed that those risks are mainly covered in Europe by public or PPP, public-private schemes. And, and they, you can also distinguish between the short-term resource risk, so that's the risk um, accounted earlier in the geothermal project development, that is the risk of not finding an adequate resource that are covered by um, both public and PPP. But some countries also have a long-term resource risk that uh, covers some aspect of the risk uh, of the resource which you encounter during operation and due to the decline of um, temperature and flow rate over, um, over time. So it's really important to distinguish a bit of between those two because the first one is actually giving an impulse to, to the uh, geothermal industry and the second one uh, kind of guarantee that there is sustainability in, 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 the, in the support mechanism. So that was an important uh, finding as well. Uh, there are other risks. Uh, we're a bit short of time, so I'm just going to quickly go through them. Um, the risk coming from external context is an interesting one that is covered by public institutions in Germany and hing in Hungary. And also, this is a, um, targeted by the private scheme in Turkey. And it really focuses on the lack of financing on the next phase. So, um, this is exactly a project that has a successful exploration, but then run out of steam, the financial steam to carry on and going to the next phase. So this type of risk may also be covered by public institutions and also private. Uh, maybe a, a word about um, the technical risk, uh, that will be the e-risk category that um, of the dual risk risk register version four that Thomas just presented. And that uh, we found was more um, suited for more mature market conditions, just like Germany, where it covers some technical issues um, encountered during workovers and, and production in general. So in order to have a proper, uh, an adapted um, scheme, you, still need, you, you first need to identify what are the precise risks you want to transfer or take on. On slide um, seven now, you will see um, 
there's the third key aspect, which is the funding. And the question here to be answered is how do I finance those risk mit mitigation schemes? So um, quite obviously for public schemes, uh, the funds are coming from public revenues, whether it's fine, taxes, surcharge, or, or fees from the application for um, subsidies. Uh, for the private sector, for the private schemes, it could be a percentage of the revenues of the private company or the revenues of a dedicated business unit to the development of geothermal. And the, uh, in the case of the public-private partnership, it has to be, a, again, a compromise between the two. Usually what they've done in France is they have a seed capital that is fed by the shareholders, and then the application fees uh, carry on seeding the fund. Um, and from, from the French experience, this setup is quite sustainable. A fourth aspect of the scheme that is important to address when you set up a new scheme is all um, that is related to the procedural aspect. How we're going to um, process the application, how the granted aid uh, is going to um, assess uh, the application and how uh, the process is of granting an aid is, is uh, implemented. So quite obviously it has to be done by a very lean structure and, and clear, simple streamline uh, procedures. So it has to be clear from the, the, the applicant side that um, what the information are required, what documentation they need to, to submit with the application, and from the side of the uh, granting aid and the operating um, entity that is uh, running the scheme, um, they need to have also a very clear role defined and workflows to go through the assessment and also go through the decision process. So it has to be quite transparent, but defined. And lastly, um, the fifth key aspect of the scheme that we identified is the implementation of performance indicator. How is the uh, scheme performing? And that's quite important that those indicators are designed and implemented from the beginning of the scheme because that will require some monitoring. So in terms of indicators, there are some that are common to all schemes. Uh, you can imagine that one can monitor the number of the application, the volume of aid granted, or the evolution of the installed capacity due to uh, those uh, schemes. But there's also a set of dedicated uh, performance indicators that can be put in place, and that they are really linked to uh, the type of risk the, the scheme is covering, and also uh, to the purpose of the scheme and to the legal and regulatory framework of, of the scheme. Just to give you a quick uh, example, here in Switzerland we have a scheme uh, that is rooted in the CO2 Act. So one of the obvious performance indicators we're going to follow is the reduction of the ton of CO2 emitted uh, due to uh, the implementation of geothermal projects. But you can do a um, similar dedicated uh, performance indicator for the PPP and for the private sector. So these uh, results are still preliminary. So you'll see uh, on slide number nine uh, a summary of all the aspects. So we are looking forward to the feedback from our partners to, um, to, to have a, a more um, a bigger view of, of those aspects and, and make changes in case, and those changes will be presented at the next uh, opportunity and the next uh, forum in October, I believe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicole. It was really interesting. Now we are going to have a short presentation by Thomas Garabetian about sustainable finance. And after we are going to the Q&A session, I would like to remind everybody that uh, it was a lot of information, but this webinar is recorded, so it will av be available online, and also all presentation will be available online. So now, Thomas, the floor is yours. So good morning, everyone. Uh, so we are uh, a bit behind, so we'll go over, uh, over this presentation very quickly. Uh, just so to give you um, a little bit of context, um, we have uh, um, several uh, facilities in, 
in Europe and several regulations that are trying to push forward uh, the energy transition for which uh, uh, geothermal is uh, obviously a resource. And among them, uh, one that um, is emerging for innovative technologies so that might be quite relevant for uh, European markets where geothermal is still emerging is the Innovation Fund, uh, where typically um, the main criteria uh, uh, of success of, uh, of a project would be a CO2 reduction. But looking on the fact that the innov that, um, uh, Innovation Fund until 2020 was not able to uh, meet the needs of the geothermal sector, uh, and other technologies, obviously, but notably for geothermal. Uh, no, there is a possibility to have some form of uh, grant-based de-risking, so up to 30% of a project finance might be awarded uh, as milestone based and otherwise uh, the rest of the grant would be um, uh, awarded on a performance criteria. So if the project does not deliver, then there is a payback. But with this um, form of uh, up to 40% of support as uh, the risk it, basically, uh, this fund might now be a much more interesting resource uh, for, uh, for the geothermal sector. Uh, we had a, a workshop on this topic uh, in Brussels um, in the framework of uh, the ATIP DG for the geothermal sector, as well as the uh, RHC uh, ATIP and the support unit uh, to the set plan implementation working group. Uh, so you can uh, find this data. We will put a link on the, on the feedback on, on this workshop uh, when uploading the presentations. Uh, now about the sustainable finance regulation. So this regulation aims to put clear criteria for the eligibility of projects to green financial products. So for instance, you can think about green bonds. Uh, and typically, the purpose of this regulation is to create an harmonized framework that will attract more capital to uh, green projects or green assets and will allow more transparency into, uh, for the funds or the um, firms that uh, sell themselves as a green financial firm. So to be more able to clearly identify who is supplying green uh, finance to ensure that this green finance flows to actually green projects and then uh, to facilitate the uh, development of a financial market on this topic. Um, for the geothermal sector, the stakes are quite uh, high because this regulation will, def will define uh, the criteria for where uh, the private cap capital will flow in Europe to renewable projects, typically. Um, as part of this regulation, therefore, there is a taxonomy that will uh, set some criteria for what is uh, a geothermal investment. So for instance, for geothermal electricity, this is, and for geothermal heat, this is a threshold for um, a life cycle emission uh, performance. So starting from uh, a proposed 100 gram of CO2 per kilowatt hour in, uh, when the regulation uh, uh, enters into force uh, and decreasing to uh, net zero CO2 uh, per kilowatt hour in 2050. Uh, and then for geothermal lead pumps, this is uh, based on, uh, on performance. Uh, for the geothermal de-risking uh, framework, this might be quite relevant because if uh, the project then comply with this, uh, this type of, uh, of uh, criteria, then the geothermal risk insurance might be considered uh, as a, a sustainable finance and might therefore benefit uh, from uh, attracting this, uh, this capital that will be reverted toward the sustainable finance investment. So thank you, that was a, a, a short overview. Um, and, uh, yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, so we have already received some written question. So we will start with this question during this Q&A session. But if you have uh, more questions, feel free also to raise your hand and I will give you the floor orally. First, a question to Ferid and uh, Thomas Le Guenon from Ricardo Pasquali. So first for Ferid, is there a mechanism in the project to include data from other non-partner countries? And I think he was probably thinking about from Ireland. Uh, 
Um, so, uh, hello, thank you for the question. Um, actually, we have received uh, some additional uh, data from countries outside the target uh, target countries. Um, I have uh, I have so far taken them uh, and uh, stored them, but uh, they have not been actively used for evaluation since my uh, uh, priority was to evaluate the the, uh, the the answers that are coming from the tar target countries. So, uh, but with that said, uh, in the uh, task uh, 2.3, which is going to be leaded by Thomas. Uh, this kind of information will be uh, very useful again and could be used for the further uh, increase of the information pool and uh, thereby increasing the efficiency of the risk assessment overall. I hope that uh, answers the question. Yes, thank you, Ferid. I have another question for both Ferid and Thomas. I don't know who wants to answer. Is how have you evaluated the risk index. So, um, uh, to answer that question, it would be easier to uh, refer to the questionnaire. The questionnaire came with uh, additional uh, documentation where the risk uh, index was explained. Uh, there was given a scale uh, based on the damage and the frequency. Um, to the, the long story short, I could say that we have tried uh, during during the, the the task we have tried several uh, trial and error uh, scenarios to evaluate risks, and uh, in the end we have provided uh, a scale that could be found uh, inside inside uh, each uh, questionnaire. Uh, the damage was a uh, monetary damage, which uh, combined all uh, time of consequences of the risk, including the personal personal injuries, environmental damage, and technical damage, as well as financial consequences of, uh, of the occurrence of the risk. Um, they were all uh, to be converted into a monetary uh, value. And then uh, in, in the questionnaire, the, the corresponding um, uh, level of the damage must be must have been taken in case of the frequency there was also four uh, options to choose uh, based on the how frequent uh, how expected the risk is um, the the risk index was um, calculated based on the formula that i have presented uh, during the risk assessment presentation of mine thank you for it for this clarification I have no um, more an input than a question from Frédéric Guino. So for both you, Thomas and uh, Ferid, is to take more consideration of well design and in particular completion design when we look at the risk. I will continue now with a question to Nicole from uh, Sis Williams. So how is the value of development of these schemes quantified? in Switzerland. He's giving the example of the UK government who decided not to draw up legislative or financial support schemes. So how could uh, they learn from Switzerland? How have you quantified sort of the benefits of, of such a scheme in Switzerland? Unfortunately, these schemes, uh, we implemented them uh, 1st of uh, January 2018. So we do not have a quantification of the performance of the scheme yet. However, all I can say is that uh, we have uh, received a, numbers, a significant number of applications and um, we're in the process of evaluating some of them. We have signed a few subsidy contracts already. So there's a first good um, feeling about those, uh, those schemes, but we don't have enough um, time uh, for this implementation to be able to, to have a, um, a kind of a conclusion or, on a, or a, a definite um, idea about those uh, the performance of those schemes yet. Yeah, probably mm -hmm. an idea for follow-up activity for all these schemes indeed to have uh, the assessment. I will now come back again on risk assessment. So I don't know if Thomas wants to answer to Arish Pupula. 
Have you just taken the average of all the responses that you have collected? And second question, are the geological risk indexed in detail? And if yes, are they the same for each country? Um, I will try to answer this again. So uh, they have been an average. Um, in the report, they will be given the uh, graph, just the one like uh, the Thomas presented. And uh, under the graph will be given the average for each of the categories of the risk. Uh, however, uh, since the geological system in each country is unique, uh, making an overall average uh, was unwise. So what I presented here was all, uh, all, only an uh, indication of the most challenging risk in each country. And um, but they are not to be confused uh, with the, um, so to say, average risk overall. Uh, I believe taking into consideration the pre settings, the market maturity, this kind of uh, um, relation between the countries is very delicate thing and cannot be taken uh, simply by averaging, uh, averaging the risk index. Um, uh, I believe I, I hope I un answered uh, the the intention of the question correctly. Um, Philip, could you could you repeat the second question? So, are the geological risk indexed in detail, and are they the same for each country? So, indexed in detail, um, we have tried to do that. We have tried initially to differentiate the index for each category, uh, meaning the, each category of social risk and uh, geological risk and uh, drilling risk had to be different. Um, yet in practice, when we tried, uh, we have made a trial run, we have seen that this leads to additional work which is not equivalent to, to the output that we get in, in result. So just to cap it up, um, in, in, this, in, this, in this task, we have tried to make it not as detailed as possible, but uh, rather to give an overview of the uh, general, general uh, risk. As, as you have uh, also noted, uh, 50 risk is a bit, small number for the multitude of risks that are occurring in geothermal industry, especially for geolo geological risk. So our goal here was not to go into much detail, but go, um, having um, an overview over over the risk. So uh, short answer, no, we didn't go into detail. Okay, thank you, Farid. I do not have more right hand question. Do you want to raise your hand to ask an oral question, which will be the last question? I see Abdek Mahmoud Abdi, you want to raise your hand, so I will start with you. So the floor is yours, you can ask your question. Hello, my name is Abdek Mahmoud Abdi. I am from ODEC, the Jewish Office of Geothermal Energy Development, and uh, I have assisted to your webinar. It was very interesting because actually uh, the, the mitigation, the risk mitigation of geothermal energy is actually in the, uh, our, our, our important, uh, is an important issue because uh, first of all, we have to, uh, we have to um, mitigate risk during the exploratory, uh, during the exploratory activities and then we can do, as you said, PPA, or we can you know, do, do a PPA with a contract with an IPP. And uh, actually, is a, um, the, the, risking, the risking tools is not available in our country. And we have the GRMF that are taking care of all risk. Uh, and in, in uh, African Union and uh, African Union level, but in country we don't have any an, uh, any mitigation risk mitigation tool so actually jrmf is not uh, uh, is not working very uh, very 
very usefully and we ask we actually we actually want to ask if there is any uh de-risking tools available even in europe and how can we do it? and as a uh, developing as a developing countries how can we do and because we actually what we want to to develop some some area to develop geothermal energy but actually we have to secure the financement for exploratory phase and we have to uh, secure uh, to mitigate the risk also so actually we want to to ask to ask what kind of uh, de-risking tools can we use uh, in european level and how can we do it thank you very much thank you for your question Abdek Mamboudardi. So uh, indeed, as you have seen from the presentation, we aim also at covering countries outside Europe. Also, the first work we have done is concentrated to Europe. The instruments and the tools we aim at designing and implementing uh, should be also replicated outside Europe. So uh, we have all indeed targeted also Africa as a, as a, as a region where we would like to cooperate and to work with. Uh, we have notably uh, established contacts and, and the World Bank is in uh, the advisory committee. So um, what I uh, mentioned is that these activities outside Europe are just starting, you know, this month. So they will last for the, for the next uh, 24 months, for the next two years. So um, I take note of your interest. Uh, we have your contact details. So what I suggest is that when we have things available um, for our Africa, we come back to you and, and we see how we can uh, progress. It's already 10 past 12, so I think it's probably time for us to conclude this webinar. We thanks all of you to attend this webinar. We were uh, about 80 people attending this webinar, so uh, we are really happy about all this interest. We have seen also from the question that there's a lot of uh, interest about our project. So as we said, we are organizing several webinars, several workshops uh, in key countries, but also uh, we will look at on other countries. So if there's an interest, feel free to contact uh, the different partners, the project coordinator, EJEC, and hope to see you soon for our next activities and for a good results of this project journey. It's time for me to close this webinar, and I wish you a good end of the day. Good night.